My name is Eric Jensen. I'm the Chief of Surgical Oncology at the University of Minnesota. I am a hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery specialist, and my clinical focus uh, is on microwave ablation of liver tumors. When it comes to patient positioning, uh, really I try to do everything the same way every time we do a case. So the patient is arms out, supine on the table. Depending on the length of the case, we may or may not add a Foley. We always add a footboard because we do sometimes have to move the patient around in reverse trend Allenberg quite a bit. Um, the port sizes that we use are generally speaking 112 port to allow access for the ultrasound probe. And then depending on how many lesions uh, we need to treat and where they are, uh, we may add anywhere between one to three five millimeter ports. That also depends on whether we're gonna have to mobilize the liver to get to difficult lesions or not. Um, so the number of ports is a little bit flexible, but always a 12 millimeter port to allow for the ultrasound, and then at least one five port to allow for a camera, and then additional five ports, depending on instrumentation that you need. So with regard to the room setup, um, as I said, the patient is arms out supine. Uh, my typical approach is to angle the table slightly so that the uh, microwave machine can sit over the right shoulder, and that way there's no problem with the length of the cords uh, to reach the patient very easily. Um, as far as port positioning goes and specific positioning, some of that depends a little bit on the lesion location, but um, really there's one way that we can do this that will make you successful in almost every circumstance and allows you to reach every part of the liver. And that is to have a camera at the umbilicus and then to have your ultrasound port, which is a 12 millimeter port, uh, along the right flank or right upper quadrant, more lateral than you might think. Uh, and the reason for that is it allows you to get the port coming in from the patient's right and have an angle on it so that you can direct the needle under your ultrasound probe, but also parallel to the transducer. And in doing that, you'll be able to see the complete trajectory of the needle along with your target. And especially if you're getting started, this is by far the simplest way to ensure that you have good targeting and that you don't struggle with difficulty of visualizing the tumor and also getting your needle to the right location. So it's a very simple setup uh, that will work 99% of the time. So with regard to needle placement, really that can be standardized most of the time also. And what I mean by that is you can reach almost any location in the liver if you place your needles coming from in the, in the region of the sub xiphoid area. That allows you to reach segment seven, segment eight, posterior six. It allows you to reach all the way over to two and three. And so if you're treating multiple lesions by low bar, you can usually hit all of them using a PRXT20 probe, depending on the body habitus of the patient, um, coming from the xiphoid region. The thing that's really critical to help you be successful is making sure that you're lining up the transducer uh, with the trajectory of the needle and they should be parallel. So the transducer is coming from the patient's right. In this example, we're uh, angling the transducer so that the needle can pass underneath it. And that allows you to target anywhere that you need to target in the liver. Um, what you really want to make sure is that the needle and the transducer are directly aligned. If you set yourself up so that the transducer is looking at the tumor and your camera coming from the umbilicus is looking directly at the transducer, then you know that if you drop a needle on the line between your camera and your transducer, you will be in the plane of the tumor. And the only thing that you have to then determine is the depth of the tumor away from the transducer so that you can place your needle appropriately distant from it. Uh, that's a really easy way to remove a lot of the variability of your targeting. There will be times where you might have to desufflate the abdomen a little bit. Uh, if your patient's body habitus is a little bit larger, or if you're trying to reach for a tumor that might be at the very high dome of the right liver or posterior on, posteriorly on segment seven, occasionally I'll desufflate the abdomen down to about eight, and that will allow for a little extra length on the needle if you're having a difficult time reaching a tumor. But the vast majority, uh, you really should be able to reach with a 20 centimeter probe. Uh, alternatively, there are some cases where you might decide to use an SR25 probe, just if you need a little bit of extra length or if you have a little bit larger tumor that you want to burn.
There are a few areas of the liver uh, that you really do need to be cautious about uh, before performing any ablation. And really, the I guess the main one is in the proximity to the porta, uh, specifically the bile ducts. So if you have a tumor that's within a centimeter of the porta hepatis or with a centimeter of a main uh, bile duct, that's something that ablation, you need to be very cautious or maybe avoid altogether. Uh, because one of the issues is if you burn a tumor that's too close to a significant portal structure, uh, you can stricture the hilum, you can stricture the bile duct. And if you cause a stricture in the bile duct, that can be a very significant problem. So you have to use uh, a lot of extra caution if you're trying to treat a lesion that is adjacent to the porta. And my general rule of thumb is if it's within a centimeter, you probably should think of other means of treating that lesion. For deeper lesions, the setup that I've described actually works uh, really well. The one thing that you sometimes will have to do, especially if you're doing a tumor that might be deep in seven in the posterior liver, um, in many cases, you'll have your ultrasound angled over the back of the liver, and you won't be able to see the transducer because it's around uh, the dome on the backside. And so as you get your needle in position, sometimes that can be very difficult, but actually a very simple maneuver to just lift the probe up and check the angulation of the ultrasound and then drop it back down where you need to be is a very simple maneuver where you can uh, back up the transducer so you can see your needle. And then as your needle progresses towards target, you just uh, replace the ultrasound uh, back into the deeper part of the liver. So deep lesions are something that a lot of people do struggle quite a bit with because of the fact that you uh, have a lot of liver tissue to get through before you get to your target. But if you use the right setup, you'll be on target before your needle ever hits the liver. And that's really the trick to this. I think the robot really adds very little and becomes a hindrance um, when, when we're talking about ablation, frankly. Um, so there are a lot of cases where we do perhaps a robotic resection combined with ablation. But really in those cases, I undock the robot and I perform the ablation laparoscopically. I think some people do wonder if you can use the robot with the ultrasound and have one surgeon sitting at the console and another surgeon holding the needle and trying to guide the needle. And I just think that's a flawed technique. I think if you really want to be an expert in this, you need to have your hand on the ultrasound and your hand on the needle uh, to guide yourself to the tumor. So when it comes to the robot, I think at, at the present time, I would say if you need to do resectional surgery and you're comfortable with the robot, great, use it. Uh, if you are planning an ablation as a part of a resection, or if you're planning just a straight up ablation, laparoscopic uh, surgery and laparoscopic approach is really much easier uh, to do. So on the ultrasound, we use the basic, it's actually a pre-programmed liver setting. And I personally don't use anything fancy. Uh, there, are there are places where they use uh, contrast materials for better ultrasound guidance, but I just generally have not found that to be necessary. Um, I think once you get comfortable with the technique and you're using ultrasound every day in your practice, um, those types of add-ons, I just haven't found to uh, add to my success rate. So to me, I just, we use a very basic uh, ultrasound machine with uh, one critical feature. The ultrasound, laparoscopic ultrasound probe that you use has to have uh, freedom of movement in all dimensions. So you have to have a probe that can move up, down, left, and right that'll make your life much easier. Um, but as far as the actual ultrasound itself goes, um, you can really get by with a fairly basic system as long as you have good image quality. A couple of thoughts about the ultrasound itself. Um, when you're using a laparoscopic ultrasound probe, you do wanna make sure that you have the probe in the locked position so that when you manipulate the end of the probe, it stays where you put it. Um, I have seen people try to do this where they don't have it locked, and that forces you to constantly have your thumb uh, manipulating the end of the device. And that makes it much harder because that's just an extra thing that you have to worry about. So again, I try to use the same setup every time, which really simplifies things. But it, it essentially amounts to having the probe coming in from the patient's right flank with an angle on the probe, which you can lock in place so it stays angled. and then. Uh, rotate the probe so the heel of the probe is up out of the way of the needle. And again, you want the camera looking directly at the transducer, and then you can drop your needle on the line 
between your camera and the transducer. And if you have the probe locked in place, it's a very simple thing to just hold the device and very gently rotate it back and forth with small movements. That's another thing that uh, I try to focus on. People do sometimes have a tendency to make movements that are far too large, and then they kind of lose track of where the needle position is. So very, very small movements as you're getting ready to target. Another comment would be try to keep light pressure on the liver. That can be difficult when you're concentrating, but if you push too hard on the liver, you can obstruct your own view or you can cause it so the ultrasound flips out of place. Either of those things is difficult because then you have to restart. So some of the pitfalls or some of the things that can go wrong um, in general when you're performing ablation, particularly if you sort of set up with what I've described so far, there will be times where you put in uh, your ultrasound and you realize, you know what, this is just not the best position. I'm struggling to get my needle under the probe. Or you might realize, you know what, I put the skin incision for the needle to pass through a little bit too low and I just can't reach. So what I would say to those kind of situations is, you know, I'm sharing a general principle here that will work for most cases. But not always. And there are definitely times where I think, you know what, I put that needle in the wrong place. I'm going to have to move it two centimeters to the right. And so I would say that you should have a low threshold to either adding an additional port or changing the location of where you put that needle through the skin. And the reason for that is if you focus on the basic principles of what you need to see when you look in the abdomen. So you need to be able to see the ultrasound transducer. You need, you, you need to be able to look directly at it and you need to be able to get your needle in between your camera and your probe. And so if you're struggling with that and you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to have to add a port or I'm going to have to change the position of my needle. I wouldn't stress over that, but be thoughtful about it. When you're looking in the abdomen, think to yourself, okay, how can I get it so that I'm successful with my setup? And then decide, okay, does my needle have to go a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, a little bit more cephalad, whatever it might be. But give it some thought before you add another port so you don't end up with 10 ports in the abdomen. Obviously, that would not be ideal. So there are a few things to consider when you're um, thinking about your strategy, especially if you have multifocal disease. Um, what I've described so far will allow you to hit any tumor in any part of the liver uh, but there are a couple areas that can be more difficult or more challenging uh, and sometimes a reason to maybe adjust the positioning a little bit. So, for example, if you have a tumor on the very low end of segment five or on the undersurface of the liver next to the gallbladder fossa, for example, you do have to be careful not to put your ultrasound port too high. Because if you're too close to the ribs and you're too high, when you try to look down on that liver, you're going to have a port, uh, excuse me, an ultrasound that's angled in a very awkward way. So there's two ways to get around that. Um, one thing uh, that you can do is actually turn the ultrasound upside down and look at your tumor from the undersurface of the liver and then have your needle coming from above. That allows you to keep the exact port positions that I've discussed so far. Um, that can be a little bit of a mind game. It's not easy to do, especially if you're sort of early career or you're just learning how to do this, but it's certainly something that you can get very comfortable with very quickly once you've had some time to practice. The other alternative, if you're only treating that one lesion, for example, you can always just cheat your ultrasound a little bit more inferiorly. So if you move your ultrasound a little bit more caudad on the abdominal wall, still on the flank, but just move it a little bit uh, more distal, that'll allow you to get a better angle for those lesions that are maybe in the difficult lower part of segment five or six. One other area that can be difficult is if you're uh, similarly on the lateral segments of the liver on the left side and particularly if it's on the undersurface where it might be sitting on the stomach or something like that. So anytime you're thinking about other organs, obviously you have to protect them during ablation or move them away with a retractor. But undersurface of segment three, for example, that's another time where you can still use the exact same setup we've talked about, but the ultrasound probe, you might find it's actually easier to put it under the liver. So then you have the ultrasound under uh, the lateral segment and you have a needle that's coming from above. Again, that's a technique that gets, it takes a little while to get used to maybe, but it's actually very easy once you're used to it. And it allows you, as I said before, to treat really any part of the liver with the same setup without having to move a lot of ports around or add a lot of ports. Um, you, can, you can, in most patients, hit just about anything um, with the setup we've discussed.
Something that can add significant difficulty um, to targeting lesions in the liver is the presence of cirrhosis. So if you're at a center or if your practice includes patients that uh, have liver disease, or if you have a transplant program and you're dealing with cirrhotic patients in, on a regular basis, that definitely adds complexity to targeting uh, because once your needle is in the liver, the parenchyma itself is too firm to make a lot of adjustments as you move towards your target. So all the things we've talked about are still true, but you just have to be extra fastidious about your needle placement before you enter the liver. Because once you enter the liver in a cirrhotic patient, you really cannot change the direction of your trajectory. So all the setup is the same. You still want the ultrasound probe looking back at your camera, your camera looking at the ultrasound probe, uh, at the transducer, uh, but you really got to be careful when you place your first uh, stick into the liver that you're as accurate as possible. And I would also say, if you notice early on that your trajectory doesn't look quite right, get a mental picture of that, remove the needle early on rather than digging around the liver for 20 minutes, just remove the needle and make your adjustment early on so you don't struggle. But cirrhotic patients add a particularly difficult uh, situation sometimes, but all the targeting techniques are the same. You just have to be a little bit extra careful as you first get your needle started into the liver parenchyma. Another thing that can lead to some difficulty is obesity. Uh, depending on your practice, you may or may not see uh, patients that are obese. And obesity can be a limitation for ablation. Uh, in my practice, in 17 years, I've had two patients that were just too large to have a needle reach the tumor that we were trying to treat. Um, and so it's a very rare thing, but it is something you have to give thought to. If you have a patient with a BMI of 50, you have to consider, can I reach this lesion with a 25 centimeter probe? And in my practice, the way that I do that is I basically make some simple measurements on a CT scan, make sure that I can reach it. And that's a time where you definitely can take advantage of desufflating the abdomen. So you insufflate the abdomen to 15, uh, you use your ultrasound targeting, you get everything totally set up. You place your needle with the abdomen inflated. And then after you've made your initial uh, poke into the liver, you can tell them desufflate the uh, abdomen. I usually go down to eight, sometimes five so that you have just a, a gap where you can see uh, with your laparoscopic camera, but really the abdominal wall comes down quite a bit. Uh, and then basically you're just performing under ultrasound guidance, just like any other percutaneous ablation that they would do in IR. But the advantage you have is you've got a probe sitting directly on the liver instead of looking through sometimes 10 centimeters of soft tissue. So, uh, be cognizant of obesity. It's definitely not a deal breaker, but it's something that you do have to think about before you plan your case. One of the things that you'll definitely encounter if you're using ablation as part of your practice is patients that have had previous operations. And reoperative surgery for ablations does not limit your ability to do them laparoscopically. It definitely can add some challenges. Uh, there are definitely days where I'm spending an hour or even two mobilizing a liver that is completely plastered to the diaphragm. Um, I guess that all depends on your comfort level with, level with laparoscopic surgery. Certainly in some cases, uh, maybe that's going to mean switching to an open technique. But uh, my experience has been that almost always those cases can still be done laparoscopically uh, with the ad added time of a lysis of adhesions. Uh, but that really shouldn't stop you from trying. I don't think. Uh, you can still do those procedures. It's still a same day procedure. You still get that patient in and out of the hospital very quickly. Uh, and it doesn't affect your ability to image the liver. It doesn't affect your ability to target lesions once you've got the liver mo mobilized. So I would say that reoperative surgery is not a contraindication to laparoscopic microwave ablation. So when it comes to deciding whether to use one probe or two probes um, for an ablation, my general cutoff is if a tumor is bigger than one and a half centimeters, I'll lean towards using two probes uh, for that tumor. And the reason is it's very simple to place two probes. Once you've hit a tumor once, it's very easy to put another needle uh, to frame that tumor. Um, and in doing that, 
you can be more confident that you're not going to have a local failure on the burn margin. Okay. So if you have a tumor that's a centimeter or less, that's an easy one. It's a single probe. Our general settings are that for the PRXTs, we're using 65 watts, anywhere from five to 10 minutes. Um, if we're burning a lesion that might be two centimeters, for example, we'll use two probes. We'll burn at 65 watts. I generally will have our uh, circulators set the machine for 10 minutes, but I can always decide to limit that burn more towards the five minute range, which will typically give you at least a three centimeter burn. Um, so just for basic principles, any tumor that's less than one and a half centimeters, usually a single probe, 65 watts, 10 minutes will take care of that lesion. Anything that's bigger than about a centimeter and a half in my practice, I start to think about using two probes, but I might burn for a little bit shorter time as well. Um, that's something that you, you sort of gauge with your own experience and the exact sort of look of the tumor, uh, et cetera.